All right, let's pick a level here and we'll get some video going for this review. No, oh, jeez, I'm falling already. Welcome to my review for Spider-Man Edge of Time. Excellent. <laughs> I know. <laughs> not excellent. Hey, well, screw you too, man. Like, it's not like I didn't have those same feelings when I started playing this game a little bit. And although I wouldn't call this game excellent, I would say that it is a good game. It's not the best Spider-Man game that's out there. But when I think of some of the reviews some people were giving it, I think they were a little bit harsh. Given a considerable amount of negative feedback that I've seen, let's start with the things that it definitely doesn't do right. It needs more enemy types, for one. Throughout the whole game, you just seem to fight the same kind of security guards. Maybe some of them have shields or a couple different weapons. For the most part, there isn't a lot of variety there. There's a couple of larger enemies, but again, nothing too special. And for some reason, there's even zombie-like creatures. Zombies, again. It's like if you can't think of anything else, put in zombies. So in addition to a lack of variety of your general enemies you come across, there's also a lack of boss fights. There's only really three that come to mind when I think back towards the game. One's Anti-Venom and you fight a few different versions or compilations with that character in there. But considering the number of villains you can pick from in the Spider-Man universe, more boss fights really should have been included. Although I will give it credit for what I think was a clever twist on the final boss fight. Level design also severely lacks some variety. I guess you could say it could be expected considering everything takes place in one building. Sure, the building is as tall as Mount Everest, but it's still one building. So for most of the game, you're walking into similar rooms and down similar hallways. Whether those rooms or hallways are ones that exist in the past or in the future, they still end up looking the same. The only time they come close to making an exception is when you enter a room that's a forest in it, basically, of trees and vine. But splashing a few ferns around didn't make that much of a difference. And because it's inside a building, it's missing the opportunity to really do a lot of free roam swinging that I feel really does belong in a Spider-Man game. And with all that out of the way, I still have to say I had a good time playing it a good time playing it. Although I also have to admit that I have an illogically good time playing pretty much any Spider-Man game I can get my hands on. So where does that good time come from? Well, you get to fight a Spider-Man. I mean, that's cool in itself. Both Spider-Men, whether you're playing the 2099 version or the Amazing version, come with their standard yet fun arsenal of moves. So you get fun combos, web attacks, aerial combat, spins and throws and all these enjoyable things to do. Of course the red suited present day Spider-Man gets a much larger variety of web attacks which can come in the form of something as simple as web boxing gloves to giant web hammers to crush your opponents. Special moves you get right off the bat include the ability to speed up your reflexes and move quicker and dodge attacks and even avoid laser beams when it comes to the amazing Spider-Man. And Spider-Man 2099 puts technology on his side by making a decoy of himself so your enemies focus on that while you can go around back and take them out from there. Upgrades are also plentiful and they come in three different formats. So there's one that's shared upgrades. So these would be things that add to your hand-to-hand -hand combat combos and things like that. And then each Spider-Man gets their own special upgrade list. To purchase upgrades, you're gonna need one of two things. Spider tokens, which you get by achieving certain goals or making a certain amount of progress in the game, or you can also find the hidden spiders throughout the levels. And your other currency for upgrading your special moves is what can best be described as experience points. The other special move that they both share is the ability to create time vortexes. So you charge up your time vortex meter and you create a little bubble which slows down time in the bubble except for you. So you can quickly deal out as much damage to enemies that are very close to being completely frozen in time. Something interesting that I think they did with the special moves is that enhanced reflex mode and that decoy that you can put out has a charge meter. 
Now, if you don't use the charge meter, there'll be a secondary charge meter over top that builds up. So some of the character specific upgrades use that secondary charge meter and they provide some very powerful and cool looking attacks. But you have to be good enough with your character to be able to charge it up and not use your standard special move which gives you the advantage. So it is somewhat of a risk reward situation and something I can't really remember seeing a lot in other games. As you're playing through the game and constantly switching back and forth between Spider-Man 2099 and Spider-Man from the present, they're talking to each other and the banter between them for the most part is pretty enjoyable to listen to. Miguel! You still there? No, I'm in Venezuela. You were right, it was a teleporter. How do you know? Because I teleported. Oh, Paul, why did you risk it? I needed the guard's pass! Well, get it and stop screwing around. Head to the gateway room and try not to teleport yourself to Mars while you're at it. You really need to work on your people skills! It definitely has the campy, corny Spider-Man humor that you would expect. The only thing that did get on my nerves in the arena of dialogue was how much the Spider-Man 2099 character substituted what would have been swear words with the word shock. Everything was shock this and shock that. Hmm. This thing has a gravity reversal system to separate out precious metals. I can use that to get the shock back up there. It's quiet. Too shock and quiet. Look, maybe cute a couple times, but when you look at the sheer volume that it was used, it becomes just as ineffective as any other idiot that keeps constantly swearing. We get what you're doing. It loses the humor. So just stop shocking, substituting, shocking swear words, you shockle mother shocker. Okay, 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 enough talking about the talking. Let's talk about the gameplay some more. Which really is focused on all the special moves and combos and really just running around beating the crap out of people. And to that effect, it kind of made me feel like I was playing a old-fashioned 2D side-scrolling beat-em-up game in a 3D Spider-Man world. And if you look at it from that point of view, I did think they do a good job there. I gotta admit, by about halfway through the game, I was thinking, oh, this is starting to feel a little bit repetitive. Okay, I can kind of see where people were coming from. But the last third of the game, I felt they really turned the dial up on the intensity of the battles, which helped bring back some of the excitement. Now with that back and forth between the characters, they did try to add another component, which I didn't think worked so well. And that's the whole concept of, if someone changes something in the past, then it affects what's going on in the future. And although that's true, I thought they could have done it in a much more fluid way, which allowed for possible combinations or options on how you're going to get through a mission. I mean, how all that worked was very scripted. What you could change and couldn't change that would affect what was going on in the future was predefined and outlined. Peter! Overwhelming forces here! The Alchemax of your time should have a failed experiment lab! If you can destroy it, the quantum causality should wipe out any trace of these experimental freaks! I'm right near the failed experiments lab, Mikael. Don't worry, I'm all over this! I think it would have been interesting if they could have worked in a way where the Spider-Man from the present had a choice between this or that, and depending on which one he chose, that would affect how the next level you played as Spider-Man 2099 would have worked. Now that would have been a cool design option. Something that I really didn't have a problem with that I heard a lot of other people did when you're playing as Spider-Man 2099 were the drop sequences when you're flying down tunnels and avoiding obstacles. Once you got the hang of the controls and the way that he's supposed to move through these obstacles, things got pretty crazy, but not necessarily in a bad way. I never really got to the point where I was insanely frustrated with what was going on, and it did provide a different level of challenge, and a welcome break to the combat. So, mm, do you recommend the game? Do you recommend the game? Well, I can't deny that there's a certain level of monotonous mysticity to it. 
at times. If you got a hard on to complain, and you're going to be disappointed if you don't get the exact same experience that you got in Shattered Dimensions, probably want to let this one go. But I did feel it started solid, ended strong, you can get through slightly weak middle, and if the idea of a Spider-Man game makes you slightly less cynical and pouty, then I say it is at least worth a rental. And uh, I don't like being cynical with my games. I like enjoying them for what they are and having fun with them. I like being cynical towards people, but that's much more of a good time for me. The atrocity's back! Get him to the gateway room! You got it! That's where it began, that's where we'll end it! We're thinking alike! Took long enough. That did the trick. <laughs>